right. So let's go ahead and talk about our main discussion, which is how the advertising industry influences American politics. Now, obviously, this is there's a lot that can be talked about. There's a lot that can be talked about when it comes to the advertising industry and the history of the advertising industry and the history of how advertising has influenced politics specifically. But again, I wanted to talk about this in a number of ways. I want to talk first about sort of the origins of uh some of this political um, advertising and i also wanted to talk about what advertising has sort of convinced us into believing about ourselves um and then what it's actually like within the advertising industry and how come these ideas these toxic ideas are even allowed to release from the advertising industry um, and i also want to make a note that when i say the advertising industry like i'm not just referring to the biggest agencies that are working on like Super Bowl ads. I mean, even though they have huge amounts of money and a lot of power, when I'm talking about the advertising industry, I'm also talking about the extended view of the advertising and business marketing industry. Um, so whether these are big agencies or small agencies or people who are working on political campaigns or people who are just working on promotions for movies, like there are so many cases where the creative professional industry working on advertising and marketing um, because of their inherent conservative problematic culture results in really fucked up like you know whether it's like the star wars movie posters with john Mo boyega being pushed to the back of the poster um, to make him to make him seem like he's this minor character from tiny little things like that um like you know, advertisers lightening the skin of a black actor to, you know, advertising campaigns being fully blatantly racist. Um, I wanted to sort of talk about things that sort of apply to all those different groups. But the first place <laughs> that we need to start off, and it's kind of con kind of confusing, but I'll explain it, um, is actually juveniles vax that thing up <laughs> so let me explain i was playing video games the other day with my wife and um she was like hey did you see that new juvenile um vax that thing up video and i was like what the fuck are you talking about and apparently um the hit 2000s artist <laughs> juvenile who released um, Back That Thang Up in like 2004, she came out with a remix in 2021 called Vax, as in vaccine, Vax That Thang Up. <laughs> and at first when I heard, when I when my wife told me, I was like, this can't be real. It's like, this is, no, this is a joke, right? Um, and it actually, it, it, it was a joke. Um, I mean, it, they, they really did it, but it was in sort of a jokey-ish way. But anyways, so Juvenile posted this video. Um, it's on YouTube. It has like over 2 million views, but it has over like 50% thumbs down. So there's a lot of like the mixed reactions um, over this video. And the whole video, it's like they're making vaccine puns and whatnot. And, um, you know, it does get some praise on Instagram and Facebook. And some people are talking about how like, oh, okay, it's cool because it's nostalgic and whatnot. Um, but a lot of people are talking about how they feel a certain way about it. One, some people feel like the original music video was, you know, in bad taste. And so now they feel like this is, wasn't the best song to sort of revive and remix. Um, and then other people were like, well, you know, why do you have to make it seem as if like you need to, you know, be patronizing, um, two black people to tell them to take the vaccine, um, based off of the way the music based off of the way that the music video was because it was just really corny like you can talk about it from a different perspective that would be more respectful and so a lot of people are also saying that you know despite the fact that it is corny um you know it does hit some points on nostalgia the the message of getting vaccinated is important and it does relate to millennials and ex geners who are old enough at the stage um who might who might have family members and who are um, in a position within their family where they're the ones deciding whether or not other people are getting vaccinated. So, you know, 
there there is importance and significance on that front. Um, but one of the things that really stood out about this ad was the writing and the creative direction really reminded me about some of these ads recently that have been going out about, um, you know, inspiring people to get their vaccines. And I've... I've noticed, so there are these ads, right? They'll show up like on TikTok or, or like Hulu or whatever. And it'll be like these fast paced like shots of people partying and people dancing with each other and people packed in a nightclub. And at the end of it, it'll be like, oh, you know, go out and have fun, get vaccinated. And it's just really interesting to see the way that vaccines are being pushed um, on a marketing front. And, and, and they're being advertised in this you know, oh, it's not about getting vaccines because it's about personal responsibility and being responsible to other people by not spreading the virus. But, oh, no, like the reason why you want to get vaccinated is so you can go ahead and hang out and you can go party and you can go and start, you know, drinking with your with your buddies. And so I was like, OK, my advertising little brain was just firing off. I was like, something is going on here. Something is going on here. And so I wanted to go ahead and look into it. And I realized that there are four layers. This, this Vax That Thing Up music video, there's a four uh, 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 layer bean dip going on. Uh, what's going on, Venya? Hello, hello. All right, so here are the four things that are going on, all right? So in this ad, the first layer is to get our attention. And... Luckily, they've done a pretty successful job at it because the main objective of any ad is to get people's attention, get people to notice the thing. Whether it's a billboard, whether it's a poster, whether it's a commercial, the first objective is to at least get people to pay attention long enough to hear and see and acknowledge that that message exists. So they are successful on that front. The second layer, of course, is you know bringing back juvenile, bringing back an artist from, you know, um, when millennials and X geners were were younger, and you know, pulling on that nostalgia, that that nostalgia chord, and this is really reminds me of the similar approach that the Geico commercials have been taking. I'm not sure if you've seen uh, the Geico commercials, but uh, Geico has also been doing a lot of like nostalgic based advertising, where they'll have like Billy Blanks from Tybo, or they'll have uh, the uh, 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 artists from Tag Team. Uh, performing in a commercial and again it's just like it's the same formula that Disney has been doing using nostalgia as a primary tool to relate to your audiences but then there's another two layers that I thought was really interesting and the third layer is a company called BLK Promotion and BLK Promotion you could see this all throughout the video because what was really jarring, and I think one of the reasons why a lot of people didn't like this remix was because it wasn't just a straight remix talking about vaccines. It was also a remix that was promoting a dating app. And so BLK was being dropped throughout the music video. Like, oh, you need to go get vaccines because, you know, you want to swipe right. Like just all these like corny little lines, right? So I did some digging and I learned that the BLK app is a dating app for black singles, um, which is totally fine, right? Well, I was learning a little bit more, and um, the BLK app is actually owned and managed by Affinity Apps LLC. And Affinity Apps LLC also owns the Latino and Christian dating apps as well. So if you go on the Apple website, you can actually you know, click on their name and you can see that BLK runs those two other dating websites. But then I dug a little bit further and I learned that Affinity Apps is actually owned by the Match Group. And the Match Group is a Dallas-based company that owns Tinder, Match.com, OKCube, yeah. Okay, Cupid, Plenty of Fish, um, yeah, and Plenty of Fish, and like a couple other ones. And so what's really kind of, you know, off about the way that they marketed this was that 
instead of telling people to get vaccinated because again you know you should get va vaccinated it's the safe and, and healthy thing to do for you and your family and you and the people in your neighborhood and your community instead it was more about oh we're promoting this dating app but we can't responsibly tell you people to go out and date and meet people and kiss people and you know be physically close to them and not socially distance we can't say that without um you know promoting this idea of getting vaccinated and so what's really interesting is that um through this campaign uh blk actually added a vaxified badge to their dating app and so people on the app could actually label themselves as oh i got vaccinated um and from a marketing perspective like they did report that within less than a month uh, they have gained over a hundred thousand users who have been vaccinated or at least claimed that they are vaccinated on the app so it has been successful on that front but um the the campaign was specifically designed to address the fact that um, COVID vaccine rates among 18 to 29 year olds has been pretty low relative to other age groups. But I think one of the things that is really worth noting is that match the match group um, has a history of racism within their dating apps. And one of the leading things that has been sort of controversial about the match group is that they have allowed their dating apps to screen people by ethnicity and so many of the different policies that they have within their dating apps have directly resulted in black and asian and people of color who are on these dating apps um, resulted in them exp like you know it's it's the whole discussion of dating apps um, and people on dating apps saying, oh, no Asians, no blacks, no, no this, no that. And, and, and being really out front, uh, upfront about who they don't want to date and sort of putting it out there like that. Um, and so it's just really funny that match, the, you know, the match group is creating these apps to address the problems that they created. But, um, you know, that's, I guess that's another story, right? But then there is the fourth layer. And the fourth layer actually deserves a whole entire discussion, which is this commercial was also produced in part by the Ad Council. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the logo for the Ad Council, but I'm sure you're not familiar with the, uh, the history and the work of the Ad Council. So let's go ahead and actually talk about that. The Advertising Council. Right. Very, very famous, um, very infamous. So the Ad Council. Um, what is the Ad Council? Well, the Ad Council first started in 1941 and they immediately changed their name after their founding in 1941 to the War Advertising Council. And they changed that name because they were preparing to uh, position their agency to promote to promote wartime efforts, and so they called their agency the War Advertising Council, so they could actually sell bonds, like war bonds, and help um, finance the American War. And so, what happened was they gained a shit ton of money. They gained like billions of dollars from American people. Um, with all these posters telling people about like, okay, you know, um, you know, don't, don't be talking to random strangers about what's going on in the United States. Uh, you don't want to be informing the enemy, like a lot of pretty xenophobic shit, um, to boost support for the war. And after the war, the war advertising council actually changed their name back to the ad council. Um, and they were instructed by president Truman, to continue doing their work during times of peace. And during these times of peace, um, the Ad Council has worked on everything from uh, communication on atomic weapons, you know, the, those ads, fear mongering kids and people like, oh, you know, this is what you must do if an atomic drop, if an atomic bomb must uh, accidentally drops or if, it, if someone drops a, a bomb on us, um, kids, you need to go under the table. Um, parents, you need to do this. Like, think about the children like this 
pure fear mongering, um, anti communist red scare kind of shit. Um, the Ad Council has also worked on uh, issues related to world trade, to anti communism, to anti socialism, to pro capitalism and pro corporatism, and on ads related to religion. And throughout the 1940s, the Ad Council actually partnered with Metro Goldwyn Meyer to distribute, and you've seen Metro Goldwyn Meyer. Um, as like a production company, I believe for like movies, like you've seen their, um, like the big lion, you know, like in those movies where the lion roars, that is Metro Golden Meyer, I believe. And they worked with the ad council to distribute these ads, these very highly politicized ads, and they distributed it through movie theaters, throughout churches, throughout schools, and throughout the workplace. And so this is an organization that has been, you know, in the pockets of the American government and using advertising as a vehicle to um, essentially lay the foundation for, um, you know, what American people's politics should be. And so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the, uh, the history of, <laughs> the Ad Council's history of ads, because it's quite interesting. So I've talked about the fact that they've done work towards anti-communism and, you know, talking about atom bombs. They've worked on Nancy Reagan's 1980s Just Say No anti-drug campaign, which, you know, also leads into the war on drugs, um, which has been a notoriously racist campaign. They've worked on the Friends Don't Let Friends Drive Drunk PSA. Uh, they've worked on uh, Scruff McGruff, the Crime Dog campaigns. They've worked on campaigns for Michelle Obama's Move campaign. Um, but one of the most infamous ads, one of the most infamous ads that has been parodied and um, talked about multiple times is the infamous Crying Indian ad. And in the ad, um, which you can see on the right-hand side, or a little screenshot on the right-hand side, it starts off with this, you know, indigenous uh, Native American man who is uh, sw uh, uh, um, in a kayak, and he's going down a river, and he goes on the shore, and on the shore are all these, like, plastic bottles and all this trash, and then he's just, like, looking around, right? And then... As he looks to the camera, behind him is, you know, all this traffic, all these cars, right, from the freeway. And then you see this car uh, driving by, and a hand sticks out of the car and throws, like, a bag of fast food at the feet of this um, indigenous man. And the bag spills, and there's all this trash right in front, in front of his feet. And then he just turns very slowly to the camera dramatically. And it's infamous because you just see a single tear, a single teardrop um, roll down his cheek. And it's supposed to symbolize this idea of like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, these are the First Nations people. And, you know, they live off the land and they respect nature. And then look what we're doing. We're, you know, we're creating all this pollution. And this has been regarded as like a historic ad, even on the ad council's website they talk about how like oh my god this was revolutionary this you know uh, uh inspired a movement to create earth day and you know this one uh this won our agency two clio awards and yet a lot of people are asking you know from a more analytical perspective like what exactly does this do for environmentalism and conservation you know, what exactly does this do for indigenous people and their land? Um, and this is where shit gets even more wild. So apparently this person whose name, <laughs> oh my God, once you hear the name, you'll be like, what? They really thought that this person was indigenous. This person's name was Iron Eyes Cody. <laughs> Iron Eyes Cody, who... His birth name wasn't Iron Eyes Cody. Um, his birth name was Espera de Corti. And he was an Italian American who was notorious throughout, Holly throughout Hollywood for going in red face and playing 
Native Americans. And you can see on the left-hand side, um, <laughs> Iron Eyes Cody with actor Bob Hope um, in the movie Pale Face, which I got to see what that movie's about because if a movie like, if, if, if they're trying to talk about a movie called Pale Face, it, I bet you anything. It's going to be one of those like, oh, look at these Native American uh, you know, these savages and they are calling, they're calling me pale face. Oh my God. I got to defend myself. Like I bet you anything. It's kind of that kind of movie, but um, yeah. All right. So it, it, again, it goes even deeper. So one of the reasons why they actually went this route of um, showcasing this indigenous American person as the, the, the individual who, identifies the trash and the pollution that's going on is because at the time, um, you know, showcasing indigenous Americans was sort of a trend that um, symbolized authenticity and, you know, simplicity. And it really was just a marketing tool. And the simple fact that they had a Italian dude playing this character just goes to show that they really didn't give a shit about indigenous people's thoughts about what was going on with, you know, the destruction of their land. No, they just needed, they just needed, you know, the brown face to validate uh, their ad campaign. And even more fucked up is the fact that this campaign was funded and is in support of the Keep America Beautiful organization. And this is an organization that was created by the beverage industry and companies like Coca-Cola and Dixie Cup. And they wanted to create this organization because they were getting single-handedly blamed for their abundance of single-use plastic items that were actually causing the litter in the first place. And so really, the Keep America Beautiful campaign wasn't about environmentalism. It wasn't about indigenous people's rights or their land. It was about shifting the blame from corporate responsibility to individual responsibility. And this has essentially been the story of how we treat environmentalism, how we treat environmental racism, how we treat the destruction of land of uh, indigenous people and the way that we've you know made this completely a personal thing um we've made this a a issue of not you know not holding these accountable these these companies accountable uh for their pollution and for their um over reliance on single use items instead it is your fault you are the ones who are causing this problem all right and then I wanted to go real quick on this tiny little bit because um, I, th I just found this so fucking ironic. So um, the ad council in today, today's time. All right. I took the screenshot today. So what you're looking at is on the ad council's website, they have the leadership team. All right. And you look at all these faces and you're like, oh, they're all white people, except for one person. And uh, this person, Elise, is the only person of color, the only black woman on this leadership team. I mean, there are people of color who are in the like the senior team as you scroll down. But in terms of their leadership team, in terms of like their CEO, the people who are their directors, this is it. And the irony of this page over here is that if you go to this leadership team section, you can click on everybody's profile and you can read this thorough story about like, oh, this is their background. This is what they did in college. This is the businesses that they started. This is their stories. What happens when you go to Elise's name? You can't even click it. There is no link to actually hear her story. And so it's like, hold on a second. The ad council, the organization that positions themselves as this advertising moral compass that has worked on all these, you know, pro uh, progressive campaigns. They're, they're only black women who, you know, not surprisingly, they ended up having her be the equity inclusion uh, director. They didn't even include her 
story into their leadership team page. Like, and I, and I wish that I could say that this is a rare thing, but as somebody who is like, you know, worked for, for, for uh, marketing companies who is, applied for many marketing companies and and i've been to all different types of their websites and tried to look up oh who's their leader who is you know who's working at this company i have seen this shit time and time and time again and it's just um how (laughs) how do you not include your diversity and oh my god well um let's go ahead and move on uh, and let's go ahead and talk about how the ad industry actually impacts culture itself. <laughs> Edward says, is it even a real person? <laughs> right? You're just like, <sighs> like, what would be wild is if you did a reverse image search and you found out that that was like a a stock image, you know, stock image, business black woman. And they just added it. <laughs> All right. So how the ad industry impacts American culture. Um, Well, one of the interesting things to note is that when it comes to your advertising agency, the top creative, uh, who's often known as the creative director, the creative director represents diverse communities. And so in the creative advertising sort of chain of command, the creative director or the executive creative director or the group creative directors are at the top of that ladder. They're the ones who determine the direction of the commercials, the the copy, the the uh, uh, visual marketing. Like they are the ones who are really in control of the overall vision, similar to the way that a director of a movie will, you know, determine how the look and the feel and the flow of a movie is a creative director also has that similar level of control. And so uh, creative directors manage the look and feel of pretty much all the work. Like anything that goes out of that agency is sort of signed off by that creative director. And the photo that you're looking at right now is of Walter T. uh, Greer, who is the executive creative director for VMLY and R. And he said something really interesting. He said, quote, the job of creative, the job of a creative director is to be the ultimate, most direct consumer representative to be successful. The creative director needs to be able to sit within the shoes of multiple consumers for multiple brands. And I want you to really chew on that for a second. okay? because if you're talking about an industry that is predominantly white, And you're talking about agencies that represent clients and brands from all over the spectrum. Um, And these are brands that could be appealing to seniors or to women or to kids or to black folks or to Asian immigrants. If all these companies are predominantly run by these white creative directors, and if white creative directors are responsible for putting themselves in the shoes of these different audiences, then what does that say about the authenticity of having a bunch of white dudes sitting in the shoes of different marginalized people? And, you know, the perspectives of uh, these creative directors and their work is the, the perspective that will allow that brand to connect with an audience. And so say, for example, a brand is, you know, you have a magazine directed towards Asian people, all right, Asian American communities. If your creative director doesn't understand Asian communities, if they don't understand Asian culture, if they don't understand how Asian American communities talk or what's hip and interesting and in fashion, how are they going to accurately be able to determine what is the best marketing approach? How are they going to be able to uh, uh, attempt to determine who you should hire as a model and who you should hire as a voice actor and who you should hire as a guest Asian celebrity. And so it's up to these creative directors to embody all of the customers within their client's brand audience and to speak to them on a visceral and very intimate level. Because again, like that's how ads try to operate. They try to operate in this way of, you know, hey, I don't know you, but let me go ahead and whisper in your ear look real quick about this dating service or this new beverage, Um, you know, ads are trying to speak to somebody and trying to convince them to do something. But if 
the perspective is off, if the person who is creating the ad doesn't understand who it's for or they don't understand the culture, then the connection and the communication is off. Uh, Adrian says, Vaxxer versus Unvaxxer regarding dating. Interesting campaigning, I guess, although they're pretty exploitive. Match eHarmony. All right. This next one is um, about how ads equal visibility. Now, in marketing, um, to be seen is to exist. If no one can see what you're doing or hear what you're saying, your brand within the marketplace um, is seen to just not exist it doesn't exist and so the first objective of any advertisement is to catch people's attention which i sort of explain um, about the juvenile um, sort of remix the the objective is to catch people's attention and to uh, gain that visibility long enough so you can send your message so that's why a lot of times ads will be very disruptive they'll try to be really in your face they'll try to um, be very shocking because you want to hook you in first and then sell you that message. And so, um, you know, when we're talking about ads, we oftentimes only think about products and services. We think about like State Farm, we think about buying a new Toyota, we think about, you know, cracking open a ice cold Diet Coke. Um, and, you know, advertising and marketing agencies don't just market toothpaste and soda. Um, and this is one of the biggest problems that people have and the biggest misconceptions p that people have when it comes to advertising because by minimizing advertising like that, you minimize its impact um, by thinking that they only sell just like everyday items. Um, you know, the advertising and the marketing agency, they also market things like nonprofit, uh, nonprofit organizations. They can market phone apps. They can market uh, recording artists and their careers. They can market museums. They can market movies and TV shows. And, you know, basically anything that needs attention in order to make money, the advertising agency can insert themselves as a way to generate more attention. Um, and so the brands, the communities, the ideas that get promoted by that agency are all based off of who is in that boardroom, who is in that organization. And so similar to the phrase I said earlier, if people's stories and if the concerns of communities aren't given a platform within media, we are treated as if we don't exist. And so that's why advertising can be super, super impactful because by showcasing a diverse group of people within your ads, you can showcase that, hey, these people exist, their stories, their communities, their concerns, those things are important and that they matter. So this is why representation is, you know, so important within the advertising and marketing industry from the back end of things. You know, it's not just about the talent. It's not just about having, you know, uh, uh, diverse models and celebrities appear on the ads. It's also about who is behind the camera, who is in the boardroom um, and who is in the agency. Right. And this next section is about how agencies can shape company values and consumer behavior. So more than ads, um, you know, agencies also can manage company internal and external communication. And so you can have agencies that are working on things like, you know, influencing and shaping how companies um, write email correspondence, how they talk to their employees through internal communications, how um, companies draft up their newsletters, um, how uh, uh, CEOs are instructed to talk to their organization and to inspire them. Uh, a lot of marketing companies will actually work on things like that to build up your company culture. And, you know, if the agency is toxic itself, then what kind of culture are you actually inheriting? And so, you know, these agencies can influence how companies can speak to uh, not just their employees, but also how they speak to their own audience. You know, they can dictate um, what they are inspiring that brand's audience to do. They can inspire that brand to adopt a new set of values and a new set of morals. Um, you know, an agency can, can go up to Pepsi and say, hey, you know, I think it's a really great idea to, 
you know, hire Kendall Jenner to be the face of the generation to talk about police brutality. <laughs> and and those are conversations that actually happen. You know, those are co- are conversations that actually happen that, you know, like you see an ad like this and you look at all the people that were involved in this commercial with Kendall Jenner and all of it got signed off on. At no point did an executive say, you know what? This is kind of a bad idea. Maybe we shouldn't have a Kardashian, um, you know, being the face of a, 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 a issue on police brutality. And so, you know, these are um, these are important questions that we need to ask ourselves because, um, you know, we sometimes think that agencies are just, um, you know, working in the back end, they have no real power, but, you know, they, they, they definitely do. And then I want to discuss about how media and the media created by advertising can serve as a very, very powerful tool for either validating ideas or people or movements or demonizing them. And so, you know, media in general offers an opportunity to create space for representation. Um, Advertising historically, um, you know, that has been advertising's main goal. Like if you're talking about it from the perspective of, you know, ads are, are, are implemented to introduce a new product, maybe a new product that you didn't know exist, maybe a new product within a new sector within the marketplace that you didn't know was a thing. Um, And so advertising has always been really great at that. But it, advertising has also been, you know, very notorious for propaganda and spreading racism and spreading um, very toxic ideologies. And so, you know, media can either demonize people and create certain perceptions or it can amplify them. And one of the, the ads that I was really thinking about that sort of encap- that captures this um, are the Nike ads featuring Colin Kaepernick, uh, you know, during uh, uh, the height of Colin Kaepernick's sort of controversy with the NFL, his protest of the NFL. Um, Nike took a stand and, and released an ad uh, that said, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. And so this is one case of an ad of, of an advertising agency and a brand actually using their platform for good. Uh, but there are also a lot of <laughs> ads that um, sort of go in the opposite direction. Amico says, thank you for mentioning uh, the boardroom and the crew hired to do these ads. It's more than just the actors. One can do an ad with people of color, but the company and crew have a, has a severe lack of diversity. Then it ends up being superficial and insulting. 100%. And, and, and this is also why you know it's so important to have uh, people of color and uh, marginalized folks represented within the boardroom. Because there are so many ads where you just have white people who are just like, yeah, this is pretty hip. This is pretty cool. I think I'm just going to go ahead and sign off on this thing because, you know, I think this will go viral, but they don't really know the context and the importance of the thing that they are showing. All right. Now onto this next section, mad men, furious women. So, there was this article um, that I had read about uh, called Mad Men Furious Women by uh, Zoe Skamen. And uh, she was talking about how the, you know, her experiences with uh, misogyny and sexual harassment within the industry and how it has been ongoing for like over a decade. Uh, you know, the, the values and the messages made by the ad industry are heavily influenced by who is working in the industry and the culture that exists within the workplace at that industry or at that agency. Um, You know, it's funny because we look at shows like Mad Men and especially for advertising people, uh, we tend to look at shows like Mad Men as this complete, you know, work of fiction. Uh, And we talk about how like, oh, you know, the work is so much more complicated than that. And, you know, that's not real. And, And yeah, for the most part, like, you know, Mad Men is a fictional show and it doesn't represent what it's really like to be working, you know, long hours on advertising campaigns. But one of the things that they definitely got right in that sense is um, the abuse and the rampant harassment towards women in advertising. 
Um, and you know, from from that article uh, published by Zoe, Zoe's just talking about how, you know, in her experience and the experiences of a lot of different women in the industry, like the abuse comes from all different directions. Like you have abuse from employers, uh, where you have people who are you know treating women like office amenities um who they only deserve to get hired for the sole purpose of potentially being one of these coworkers dates you know like you'll have these stories of of uh uh bosses who are like oh i hired this pretty pretty copywriter because you know i knew that our junior copywriter um or our senior copywriter might think that she's hot you know um, and, and women in the industry have talked about that, that they have been, you know, they've heard or they've been told explicitly that that is why that they were hired. Um, then you have cases where uh, women's ideas are consistently stolen and given credit to their male uh, executive uh, creative directors like that. Ha that was also another thing that happened in uh, Mad Men where you had Peggy, who was, you know, consistently the copywriter who was working on the campaigns but it was don draper it was uh the the boys club that would essentially get the uh, the recognition the pay and uh there's also the issue of women who are asked to be these workhorses who are asked to you know oh you know we'll have you work on this campaign you'll have your name on uh, on this project but when it actually comes to getting the credit, a.k.a. getting a raise, getting a promotion, um, oftentimes these women are overlooked by these men. And then you have abuse from coworkers, like men who, you know, make the workplace incredibly uncomfortable for women um, because based purely off of like, oh, I want to pursue this woman. So I'm going to use every opportunity I can to hit on her or or to, you know, flirt with her. And it just becomes an atmosphere where it's like, how can you even concentrate on your work when these dudes are constantly trying to hit on you and not see you as, you know, an equal employee? Uh, and then you also have these issues of male coworkers who say and act out in inappropriate ways uh, because they think that this legacy of the ad, in, ad industry as being this boys club, as as being this like, oh, yeah, you know, we're like you know, razzing on each other and, you know, we're talking shit and, you know, the, the advertising industry, we're all about being witty and, you know, um, uh, edgy. And there are a lot of creative men who use that as an opportunity to justify their own bigotry. Um, and then you also have abuse from clients. Um, so beyond just the abuse that you're getting from your coworkers and from your employers, uh, there's also women who have reported rampant abuse from their clients. So these are clients who who treat women as part of the deal. Women, uh, uh, clients who who treat you know them hiring an advertising industry or a, a, uh, sorry hiring an advertising agency as if that grants them permission to start you know uh, feeling entitled to the women workers at that agency. Um, and this is because these are clients who, you know, gas themselves up thinking that, oh, well, I can get away with this abuse because I'm keeping their lights on. You know, I'm paying for this for this agency. I'm paying for that copywriter to even have a job. Um, and then it just reinforces itself when you have, you know, these men who are in these managerial positions and the just allow this shit to happen because they're like oh well you know my job's on the line so i don't want to say anything i don't want to cancel this person i don't want to fire them from our accounts they're paying my check too all right whoops i guess i uh, accidentally added that thing but i actually wanted to go into this bit here um let me go ahead and read a couple comments over here uh doo -doo 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 -doo. amico says uh nike has its own problems in regards to its policies regarding maternity leave for its sponsored female athletes hence female athletes leaving for athleta allison felix and uh, simone biles oh yeah i heard about that yeah i mean again me bringing up the colin kaepernick thing is not to say that nike is you know this progressive powerhouse even though they want to position themselves that way 
because the reality is Nike has a very, very checkered past with not only how they treat their employees um, from the creative perspective, but also, you know, how they treat their workers overseas. And so Nike has been do, trying to do a lot of damage control and even their use of Colin Kaepernick, despite the fact that I totally agree with who they decided to support, um, it did also make me feel like, you know, how much of this is them posturing themselves as a progressive company versus how much of this is actually them attempting to do good. Um, Sunshine says, they always used me for the digestible black girl. Never saw me with a non-black partner unless it was part of a scene or it was an alcohol advert. Oh my gosh. Um, Venya says, art imitates life. My friend was told that she was hired because she was pretty. She was a secretary for an elementary school. Oh, God. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about how the how advertising sold us on the idea of the perfect woman. All right. So the history of women in ads. In order for us to really think about how the image of women and, and what women should do and what women should, how they should behave, uh, we need to sort of take a brief look at the history of advertising um, and specifically advertising for women. Because women have been advertised... Um, to since the late 1800s. I mean, I mean, there have been a lot of vintage ads um, in the Victorian area, Victorian era, and there are a lot of, of those vintage ads that are now seen as like art, works of art and people hang it up on their, uh, as posters on their wall. But women's advertising really started to flourish um, as more women entered the workforce and as they were seen and treated as viable customers who had money to spend. And so um, timing that in tandem with the explosion of newspapers and magazines, like now you have, you know, publications that were also posting more niche content, stuff related specifically to women. And so that's when you start to see a lot of women's advertising start to, to blow up. Uh, but also keep in mind that magazines and mass media, they are fueled by advertising. And so where there is media, there are ads. And so since the beginning, the foundation of women's advertisement has always been focused on shame. Um, always focused on this soul focus. Oh, focus on the soul focus. <laughs> Always focused on this idea of telling women um, that they're living their lives wrong, that they have the wrong face, the wrong nose, the wrong skin. Um, and this patronizing perspective is always used as a way to sell things like traditional family values or femininity or, you know, X and Y beauty and social status. And so, you know, these ads from the start were always designed to make women feel insecure, uh, to make them feel insecure about their cooking in order to sell appliances. It was about shaming women for, you know, smelling bad in order to sell deodorant, uh, which this ad in the background over here says, says nice eyes, nice teeth. Um, and then it says, but uh, these charms may be wasted if she uses the wrong deodorant. And so, you know, everything from shaming the way that women look to the way that women smell to the body types that they have to the, you know, food that they eat has always been demonized as a way to sell products. And that's the thing that I think is really important to know is that it's not just a matter of demonizing women for the sake of demonizing women. It's demonizing women and build and breaking them down so you can build them back up with consumerism. So you can build them back up with fresh new Colgate toothpaste or these new hair curler curlers by Johnson and Johnson. Like, you know, that, that is the purpose. I don't know why I'm like going really close to the mic. <laughs> that is the purpose of uh, uh, denigrating and shaming women in advertising. Um, and unfortunately this is still very much, um, you know, the, the the norm although things have definitely evolved and so the ev the evolution of women's ads is that um you know 
women grew tired. They, they, they grew tired of being told that they were too fat, that they were too thin, that they were too dark, too old, too emotional, or that their bodies have changed, you know, from five or 15 years ago as a body should. <laughs> um, and women were just tired of being told what to do by male advertisers at every stage of their life. I mean, you're talking about ads targeting women when they're, you know, uh, 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 toddlers telling them to play with this toy, wear this color, act this way, be this way, um, all the way up to telling women how to act in their 80s and in their you know senior years. And so women grew tired of being told by men what's important in their life and what makes them beautiful. And that youth is this ideal that every, every woman needs to chase in order to you know deserve an ounce of respect. And so I think the accumulation of all of this social pressure created by advertising and media, it didn't just impact women, but it also indoctrinated a lot of men. And so um, I think this resulted in a lot of women feeling insecure, feeling incredibly depressed uh, for not being able to reach those high standards. And there's a really great, uh, great quote by, uh, from this article by Jane Cunningham and Philippa Roberts that says, the dreadfully named fem empowerment movement seems to us just another perfectionist stick to beat women with. Where once women had to be thin, now they have to be strong. Where once women had to be beautiful, now they have to be brave. Women are told by Barbie to dream big, as if their own lack of imagination is the cause of the gender pay graph, almost double the size of the national average in creative advertising agencies. Women are told to stop saying sorry by Pantene when perhaps they're just being polite. And sometimes the messages these sort of campaigns carry are a coded way of telling women, just act a bit more like men, would you? Or even more distortedly, the message is that women are somehow at fault for having believed the perfectionist narratives in the first place. And so if you notice the similar, the very similar tactic that is used to, you know, market fempowerment to sell products like <laughs> fucking bounty <laughs> uh, 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 paper towels, the same type of maneuver uh, that they're that they're using here is the same type of maneuver that the beverage the beverage industry was using in the crying Indian ad. You know, instead of shifting this to corporate responsibility, let's go ahead and uh, shift this over to the responsibility of the individual. Instead of saying that, oh, you know, we are the ones who sort of um, cause these insecurities and cause some of these problems and 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 set these unrealistic beauty standards instead of taking accountability for that nah it's your fault it's your it's your fault and you can improve it by um buying this glass of empowerment wine all right uh venya said um a nice woman in advertisement wasn't black um, if you had any kind of color to your skin, you weren't it. These women would be washing dishes and makeup on high heels and smiling like they were happy. Yeah, and that's one of the, the, the really sad things about the way that advertising has portrayed women in their marketing as if women were happy to be portrayed this way. Um, which, again, just speaks to the fact that this is what happens when you have all dudes trying to uh, make up this branding for women. All right. Now let's go ahead and talk about how advertising sold us on the idea of the ideal man. What exactly is the ideal man? Well, apparently Van Heusen can tell you what the idea of the uh, uh, ideal man is. In this little cheeky ad that says four out of five men, you know, love these shirts. And it's a photo of five, sorry, four white men in Van Heusen shirts. And then you have this, um, you know, indigenous African person who has all this, you know, these this necklace, this nose ring. You have the stereotypical bone going through their hair um, to show this idea of, oh, well, you know, only the, prim the primitive, the savage man um, wouldn't want our shirts. So let's go ahead and jump into the history of men's advertising the brief history of men's advertising because because men in 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 advertising have always been represented well you know they've always been the focus 
of these ads. Um, and a lot of these ads have highly shaped perceptions of masculinity. They've told us how masculinity is achieved. They've told us, um, by extension, what's femininity. Um, they've told us which versions of masculinity are the best. And they've also uh, advertised what they believe to be positive male traits. And this could be anything from being tall to being white to being uh, square jawed and broad shouldered. Um, there's also a lot of ads about men being stoic, of being lone wolves, of being these ultimate risk takers, these people who are super emotionless, uh, these people who are the sexually dominant guys who, oh, I got this this new Buick. Oh man, all these women are just throwing their panties at me. Um, you know, showcasing men as having this unlimited potential in life and in business and also showcasing men as being like just physically and mentally and emotionally invincible. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, these, these traits are, even though they are, you know, some people would classify them as positive traits, they are still very incomplete and very destructive and very negative traits because it still builds up this idea of what men should be. It still establishes this, you know, hierarchy and the standard of what a real man should look like. And there's a lot of crossover when it comes to racism and homophobia uh, within men's advertising. And that's when we go into the evolution of men's advertising. So, you know, despite the fact that we are in this age of the Me Too movement, despite the fact that we are having this push towards greater uh, visibility towards toxic masculinity, men's advertising is still, by and large, very far behind. Very, very far behind. Um, and I think one of the best illustrations of the pushback of male audiences and, you know, men's advertising is the infamous 2019 Super Bowl Gillette commercial. Um, and it was titled, The Best Men Can Be. So if you're unfamiliar, uh, Gillette's notorious ad, because Gillette has been around and making razors for like decades. And their original tagline was, the best a man can get. You know, this idea of like, oh, I'm this disheveled, homely looking man. Once I shave myself, I look respectable enough for you to want to hire me. And their 2019 ad was very different uh, because they were actually calling out toxic masculinity. They were calling out sexual harassment. Uh, they were talking about Me Too. And they were actually talking about how they played a role in all of this. And they did a pretty fucking good job at like addressing the fact that, you know, bullying and, you know, boys, um, you know, normalizing just like you know picking on each other has just been this thing that we've accepted as a boys will be boys kind of a thing and in the ad there's this really um infamous part where you have all these men in a backyard standing in front of a barbecue grill crossing their arms and just saying boys will be boys boys will be boys boys will and they just sound like robots and it's just it's incredibly impactful when it comes to showcasing that like you know, as a generation, a lot of men are just very arrogantly, confidently, you know, willing to just stand um, in this spot of like, you know what? I don't care about things being wrong. I don't care that these people are being toxic. This is just how men are. This is just how, you know, men speak. And not surprisingly on YouTube, this thing has 800,000 likes, but 1.6 million dislikes. And there are so many people in the comment section, so many men's who are pissed at this ad. I mean, there are so many men who like considered this the pinnacle of SJW culture. Like, oh my God, you know, this is what the meme two movement did. They caused, you know, this infamous men's brand to uh, become soy boys and betas. And so, it just showed that men don't want the advertising culture to change. Um, and it exposed how reliant 
a lot of men are as audience members and also as an industry. Um, how reliant we are on toxic masculinity, as uh, how reliant we are on misogyny, um, and how defensive we get towards any sort of change. I mean, even when it comes to just changing the way that we talk about men, it's wild, you know? Um, like values of uh, stoicism and invincibility, like all of these things are impossible standards that ultimately destroy and erode men's health. Because, again, you know, whether you are a man or a woman or however you identify, like, the standards that are placed onto advertising, that are placed within advertising on people to be the best that you can be, be this tall, be this buff, be this handsome, be this confident, like, it can be debilitating. It can make people feel like, wow, something's not wrong with me. Um And the problem is like, you know, if we don't change, um, if we don't change the way that we talk about masculinity, even within our advertising, we risk um, being victims ourselves of our own toxic masculinity. And this is what you can sort of see within the fallout of this whole Gillette commercial. Um, And it's just sad, you know, it's really sad because men, a lot of men have become dependent and their identities have been solely formed based off of what the advertising industry has created for men like so many men have absolutely no idea what masculinity is and what it can be and the different shades and the different ways that it can sort of exist in healthy and more diverse you know forms instead a lot of men just cling to this idea of the stoic sexually dominant i can do everything i will get everything type of man that is portrayed so heavily in media uh desiree said a perfect example is victoria's secret now you're starting to see them add women of different sizes because of the flack the president uh, of victoria's secret caused yeah i remember uh hearing about how victoria's secret is actually retiring their angels like this whole idea of Victoria uh, Secret Angels, uh, which is, which has been causing a lot of like uh, um, backlash from people who are like, oh my gosh, you know, this is PC culture. Oh, you're ruining what made Victoria's Secret Victoria's Secret. You know, Victoria's Secret only people only cared about it because of the models. Um, but it's funny because, and I, I guess I can only say this because I I know that you know. My wife has shopped at Victoria's Secret and she's talked about this before about how as a brand of women's lingerie, Victoria's Secret really isn't like the best brand out there. And they do not justify uh, the high price tag that they charge for their products, given how oftentimes they might not fit or how often uh, they... uh, You know, the the quality of the products will deteriorate and they're not made of uh, good construction. And the fact that there are so many other brands that are cheaper that are actually way better when it comes to uh, women's undergarments. And I think that is the main thing. I, th- I think that is one of the main things is that like Victoria's Secret is losing and, he- and hemorrhaging money because they don't have a very inclusive group of people representing their brand and because it's too expensive and because it's oftentimes very inaccessible by only being available in like shopping malls and shit. Um and yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's really fascinating to see the way that different brands are starting to adapt and starting to feel like they need to adapt. All right, let's go ahead and talk about racism in the advertising industry. Um, so racism thrives in the advertising industry. Um, 82.6% of advertising workers are white. All right, I want you to just think about that. Think about how much... 82% is, right? 82%. And when you're talking about an industry that is so heavily white, uh, you have to look at the fact that people of color are oftentimes hired when they are hired by agencies. Sometimes to just, you know, give the 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 agency a diverse look. You know, sometimes people of color are hired within these agencies, not because their ideas are going to be featured or because they're going to be put into a position of authority with where they can actually uh, make important decisions. No, they're actually added just to give 
the branding of the team leadership website a little bit of spice like case in point what happened with the ad council um at least based off of you know their exclusion of that one member um and so oftentimes like it just doesn't even matter how many people of color these agencies hire as copywriters or receptionists or graphic designers because what really ultimately matters is are these people of color in leadership roles where they can actually provide their experiences on a high decision making level um and when you don't have these people in a position of authority to actually sign off or to shut down bad ideas you have shit like this where this is the notorious i think this is like h&m i can't remember i can't remember if it was i think it was either h&m or um or target or something like that but they came up with this hoodie that they modeled on little black kid that says coolest monkey in the jungle and this ad uh this little bit got a lot of shit on social media uh, and rightfully so but these are things that it's like these are small faux pas that like you could have easily put this on a little white kid with like spiky hair you know um and it would have been and it would have worked but this is what happens when you don't have diverse people who actually have an experience talking about and navigating race all right now let's go ahead and talk about uh oh uh desiree said it was h&m all right, so let's go talk about why racism is so hard to fight within the advertising industry. Um, and that's because racism is easy. It's easy to do. It's easy to behave that way. But proving it, proving that racism happened in the workplace and holding these people accountable is damn near impossible. And especially when it comes to creative jobs, like creative jobs are inherently subjective. Um, you know, a white manager, a white creative director can shut down the ideas of a black or an Asian employee um, again and again and again and again without ever having to really fully explain the fact that their whiteness is the reason why they don't understand that idea. Um you know, creativity, when you're thinking about creativity in the workplace, uh, creativity is really hard to evaluate because creativity isn't inherently quantifiable. Like you can't just look at a painting or an advertisement and say, oh, I give that a 10. That's a solid scientific 10 in the, in, in the scale of creativity. You know, like it, creativity is a completely subjective thing. And so unless a creative idea is given the chance to shine in a public way where other people who are not that white executive, unless you can get other people to actually see and validate and, and share their opinions, you can never really accurately judge the creativity of something, of a piece of work, because again, you're only getting this judgment from this one white person or these white executives. Um, and this is a thing that happens to, uh, creatives of color in the marketing and advertising industry all the time all the time you know these are people of color who uh, bring their culture they bring their experiences um, working on the job and they bring all that to their work but if their bosses don't understand their culture if they don't want to learn their culture then they will always misrepresent their employees of color and they will always uh, uh, portray them as somebody who just isn't fitting in or somebody who just doesn't have good ideas. And so on top of all this, it's like, you know, it's impossible to prove someone is racist without like recording the conversations or getting somebody to confess. And this really applies to all sorts of creative jobs. So this is more than just advertising. This happens in the film and the TV industry. This happens in fashion, in architecture, and in culinary arts, where you have white people who are at the head of, you know, being the judges, being the um, uh, 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 managers, and being the ones who are responsible for evaluating whether or not the creativity of people of color is valid or not. All right. 
we have a couple more parts over here. I want to go ahead and talk about why the ad industry, uh, oops, I misspelled that. Why the ad industry is obs uh, why the ad industry is obsessed with awards, or the ad industry's obsession with awards. So, um, if you are unfamiliar, let me go ahead and explain. Award shows like Can Lions or uh, the Clio's, these are all status symbols and opportunities for gatekeeping. So in order to understand the elitism of advertising, you have to understand the role that the awards play. Because every year, there are a number of organizations um, and agencies that come together to compete in a similar fashion to the Golden Globes or the Grammys. And it's a way to award creative work. So maybe it's an award show for commercials, or maybe it's an award show for social media, or maybe it's an award show for, you know, uh, 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 visual graphic design, whatever. Um, there are a number of these awards, like the FEUs, the Webby Awards, um, that become a symbol that ultimately necessitates higher costs. So what I mean by that is when you win an award for your work, it means that the value of your work goes up. You know, it's kind of like when a award-winning director wins and then every movie after that, they are, you know, advertises, oh, award-winning director, James Cameron, award-winning director, uh, 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 you know, Zack Snyder. Like they always have to drop that shit because it is a branding opportunity. Like winning that award, winning any of these awards is a huge boost to your social status and your career status. And so this obsession about winning awards is also about, okay, I win these awards. Now I can go ahead and justify um, chasing bigger clients. Um, it also is a way to justify the preservation of corporate culture by saying, you know what, we won this award by acting this way. We won this award by having an all-white team. We won this award because our, you know, white creative director heard our black copywriter uh, share an idea and they were smart enough to turn it down. Like, there are so many ways that the award system and, award and awarding culture insulates the culture of advertising and prevents actual progress. And then we go into the fact that leadership roles are given to winners. So when it comes to moving through an advertising agency, especially these really big ones, oftentimes agencies will only hire creative directors who, again, within the you know ranking system of agencies are sort of at the top of the creative chain. A lot of agencies will only hire creative directors based on whether or not they have award-winning work. But if awards are won through a jury selection process, that also means that we need to look at the diversity within the jury. And when you look at award shows like the Clio's or the Effie's, there's often, or even like the Golden Globes, there's oftentimes these discussions about how predominantly white judges result in predominantly white winners. And the same exact thing happens in the advertising industry where you have predominantly white advertising jurors who are white and male. And one of the problems, again, going into the subjectivity of art and creative work, a juror could be, you know, deciding, oh, the next, you know, best or the best, you know, commercial of the year or whatever. And they could be looking at a number of different work. And you could have a agency that is from, you know, Atlanta and is, uh, directing a piece of work specifically for the black community. Well, that juror can look at that work and say, mm, I don't like it because I don't get it. I don't like this ad because um, it's just not interesting. It's just um, I don't understand the references. And this has been a problem where you have, you know, people of color who, when they do get invited to be a juror to help select the next generation of award winners who then become the next generation of creative directors when you look at that jury selection process where black people or people of color are having to talk about their opinions oftentimes they get like 
dogpiled by everybody because they are the lone person of color in a sea of white people. And they're the lone person who has to explain why this ad by this Mexican agency or why this ad by this Asian-owned agency um, is good. And so what ends up happening is like what happens to creative work made by women and people of color when it lands in a jury selection process of predominantly white folks? Okay, now let's go ahead and go into our last bit over here. I just want to go ahead and touch on a couple points since we've been sort of calling out the ad and advertising industry and sort of their impact on how we think and how we uh, vote and how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about each other. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the future of the ad of the ad advertising industry and the fact that it needs to be more diverse. So the first thing that we need to do is we must hold ad agencies and brands accountable, including Pop Chips, who signed off this ad of Ashton Kutcher in brownface um, and in a patanking accent, you know, because, oh, it, it's it's such a great idea to sell healthy chips by putting the white dude in brownface. Again, some creative director signed off on this shit. Um, and so we desperately need and we need to demand better representation representation for people of color not only in the ads themselves but in the advertising industry we need to support people of color who want to pursue a career in advertising and creative professional work um, and this is why i'm so adamant about talking about people of color who are creatives um, because like i said before we are very underrepresented in these industries and because of the nature of how subjective it is and because of the nature of how many white people are in these positions of power, um, that ultimately means that our voices, our thoughts on the work never gets heard. And so we need to be able to, you know, be encouraging of people who, you know, want to enter this industry and who want to change things and make things better. And then we also need to, uh, we desperately need diverse agencies who represent diverse audiences. Because the thing is, communication is strategic. At least within agencies, communication is supposed to be strategic. What are we saying? What, mu what music? What visuals? Who are we hiring in the commercial? All of these things are very, 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 very specific actions. Like, that's why I don't... When, when um, you know, a company has an ad that's racist, when that shit comes out, I have absolutely zero, like, sympathy. I have zero, um, you know, willingness to cut these people some slack because I know how much work went into it. I know how, you know, these decisions went up a chain of command. It went through the copywriter. It went through the editors. It went through the creative directors. They signed off on it and they said, okay, let's go ahead and produce that racist ad. Um, and so because communication is strategic, that also means that it, it matters who is chosen to create that communication. It matters who is chosen to come up with that brand strategy. A white person, a white executive's strategy for increasing um, you know, Asian buyers for an Asian brand, it's not going to be the same type of strategy that, say, for example, an Asian American executive is going to say when it comes to strategizing for their own community. And so diverse creatives are so important in terms of creating more authentic messaging for their community. And it just makes sense. Like if you were having these creative directors who, again, are responsible for putting themselves in the shoes of so many different diverse audiences, it only makes sense to have, by extension, a more diverse creative executive team. Um, now, this isn't to say that you have to be Asian to work with Asian clients or you have to be black to work with black clients, but it does mean that you have, uh, you know, by being a more diverse team, you will have access to more cultural nuance and cultural inside information and knowledge that other people won't have. Um, you know, I'm not going to pretend 
to sit here and say that as a marketer, I could do a better job about, you know, marketing for Muslim Americans or disabled Americans. Um, and so instead of gatekeeping the industry with, you know, rampant awards and bullshit accolades as a way to showcase people, people's capabilities, what we should do is we should create a system within advertising where client opportunities and job promotions are also based off of who's connected and knowledgeable about the culture. You know, who's a better representative for that respective community? Um, because again, like, I think a lot of us are, are have, have seen the effects of what decades of old white men in advertising has done to all of us.